I'm excited because we are going to get a treat this morning. We are going to hear from one of the greatest communicators ever. He is an awesome man of God, the uh, pastor in Houston, Texas. He and his wife lead multiple ministries online. They are they're in, influencing multiple generations and all of that while they're they're fathering, taking care of parenting three beautiful children. And I'm excited to welcome to the Way World Outreach today. The, the, the one, the only, Pastor Jerry Flowers. Would you give him a Wayworld Outreach welcome as he prepares to come? Give him some, give him some applause. Give him, give him a little encouragement as he comes. How about let's make some noise for Jesus in the house all over the sanctuary. The psalmist says, great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. So that means to me, if you think you serve an average God, you will give him an average praise. If you think you serve an okay God, you will give him an okay praise. But is there anybody under the sound of my voice that believes you serve a victorious God, a mighty God, a way-making God, a justifying God, a strong God, I'm going to keep going, a redeeming God, a loving God, not the God of second chances, but the God of chance after chance after chance after chance. Yes. High five two people and tell them something is going to happen today. Yeah, slap their hands till it stings. Something <laughs> is going to happen today. You may take your seats if you can. My name is Jerry Flowers. Um, I come from Houston, Texas. It's where I was born and raised, on the playgrounds where I spend most of my days. <laughs> my beautiful wife and I, Tanisha Flowers, have been married 11 years. We have three children now. Our youngest, Josiah, is five months and he is running the house. So uh, I'm so grateful uh, to be here with you all. It would just be inappropriate for me to not do this. Can we give honor to the one that God trusted to steward this house, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa, Pastor Armando. You could do better than that. Thank God for visionary. Yes. I'm so thankful that they allowed me to be here to share this word with you. I have my brother Torrance in the house, my brother Alton in the house. Thank y'all so much. I love you. There was this... This article I was reading that was rather interesting to me, it was a guy named C.W. Riley. C.W. Riley, he is a minister and a shepherd in Texas. And it just so happens that Texas has one of the most venous, venomous serpents in the nation, a western diamondback rattlesnake. And this particular day, a western diamondback rattlesnake bit one of his sheep right in the face. But I began to research this. You probably didn't know this. One of the things that we use for anti-venom is sheep's blood. <laughs> so he was watching his sheep and noticed that she was still eating. She was still grazing. She was still playing because the serpent didn't know that the blood of the lamb is stronger than the venom of the serpent. And I think right now, anybody who that old serpent's been trying to strike your marriage and strike your peace and strike your clarity, I think we need to remind him the blood of the lamb is stronger than the venom of the serpent. Y'all, something's going to happen in here on today. I want to pray and then I want to share with you what I believe God has put in my bosom to serve you. Is it okay if I do that? Is it okay if I do that? Father, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the gift of life. We recognize, God, that an alarm clock didn't wake us up. A dog barking didn't wake us up. Grace woke us up. For some strange reason, you saw it fit to allow us to remain in the land of the living. And for that, God, we simply say thank you. Worship has gone forth, which is the red carpet, saying, God, come in this house and get yourself some glory. We didn't come to hear a man. We came to get impacted by the gospel, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just like I pray privately, God, anoint me as your oracle, 
as the soundtrack, the PA system of heaven. I prayed myself hot and studied myself full, but all of it means nothing if you are magnified and if you aren't glorified. So I'm asking God, get glory in this moment. In Jesus' name, and everybody who agrees to that prayer would just shout all over the building, amen. Are y'all ready? No, you're not. <laughs> this word is going to come for your soul, high pitch on purpose, your edges, your lace front. Are y'all ready? I really do believe that this is a prophetic utterance that we're going to talk about on today because in Western Hemisphere Christianity, especially America, I believe there is not enough teaching. This is a low on the radar discussion when it comes to many pulpits. And we are not being taught enough how to identify when God is saying, this is not yours. See, I can get the whole sanctuary to shout if I begin to prophesy to you. <laughs> Somebody caught it. If I begin to prophesy to you and tell you what is yours, this is your season. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your door. Everybody begin to shout. Y'all hear them claps, right? But what about when God is saying, teach my people to identify when I'm telling them this is not yours because I have something else planned. How about this? This is not your door. This is not your year. This is not your moment. See how quiet it's getting? This is not your time. That's not your grace. That's not your calling. That's not your spouse. See how quiet it is? We have been preaching so much the yes of God that we don't know how to handle his no. And if this be true, this means you and I must be able to handle disappointment. How do you handle it when you prayed against the thing and God allows for it to happen anyway? There's so many people I'm dealing with this personally at my church that I'm graced to pastor at. A lot of millennials judge God's goodness off of his yes. But then we think God is not good when he tells us no, when he tells us wait. I know you can shout over open doors, but have you arrived to the place in your spiritual maturity where you can give God thanks for when he doesn't open doors, when he doesn't let you get the promotion, when he says no, this isn't the relationship. I know that you can shout. When God makes a way. But what about when God stands in your way? He says, I love you so much that I'm not going to stop it from happening. I love you so much that I'm going to let Lazarus die. Because you want me to come and be a healer. I want to show you that I'm multifaceted. I'm gonna introduce you to, I'm not just a healer, I also am the resurrection. See, maybe this is why when God asked Moses, whom shall I say sent me? He said, you tell him. When Moses asked God, whom shall I say sent me? You tell him, I am that I am. Because you don't know what am you gonna need for me to be. Break it down, okay. On Monday, I may be, I am your protector. But then on Tuesday, I may be, I am your mind keeper. But then on Wednesday, I may be, I am your redeemer. But then on Thursday, I may be, I am your matchmaker. But then on Friday, I may be, I am your redeemer. But then on Saturday, I may be, I am your promise keeper. You don't know what am you gonna need for me to be, so don't try to compact and compartmentalize who I am to I am, just know that I am. How do you handle it when God is telling you, this is not my will for you? And if you try to do this anyway, you'll be navigating without my hand. Maybe it's just me, but I've arrived to this place with my walk with Jesus. I don't want to be on a stage. I don't want to be on a, in a room where God's Noah's on. 
I don't want an opportunity that God has his no on. I don't want growth that God has his no on. Because watch this, all growth isn't healthy. Inflammation swells too. This is my mic, I'll throw it. Inflammation swells too. So we don't want this growing due to bacteria. We want this growing due to biblical enlightenment. And I'm not preaching to you from a height that I haven't been myself. I know what it's like to pray and ask God to allow me to get the job. And as I'm on the way to the interview, they told me they're going to hire me as a teacher. The school calls me and say, we already feel the position. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to pray and fast and believe that God is going to heal my grandmother, that this sickness is not unto death. And then I get a call two days later, your grandmother died. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to lay hands on my wife's stomach each and every night, praying over our daughter, saying that this is going to be an easy pregnancy, that there's going to be no birth defects, that God, you're going to be there through the delivery process. But then everything that could go wrong went wrong. I prayed against it umbilical cord wrapped around my daughter's neck she's being choked as she's coming down the birth canal to where our doctor literally had to jump on the bed push my daughter back in my wife's womb because the more her womb contracts the more it's crushing my daughter I prayed against that I prayed against that why when I'm asking for you to not allow this to happen you allow it to happen anyway this is a sobering conversation because a lot of us only serve God when life is good and I'm telling you there's a time coming in our nation where lukewarm faith won't keep you in a hellish season and I need you to be rooted and grounded in truth to such a degree that the wind of a pandemic doesn't blow you over. The wind of a layoff doesn't blow you over. The wind of war doesn't blow you over because deep roots don't fear strong wind. And the height, the strength of a, the strength of a tree in a storm is not revealed by the height of its branches. It's the depth of its roots. Preaching so passionately, I already sweating, and I only been up here like eight minutes. <laughs> it's because I recognize this. I recognize, and I know what it feels like to try to force for something to work. Y'all holy and spirit led. Y'all never done that, so I'm gonna just use me. I know what it's like when you're trying to force for a relationship to work. You're trying to force for something to work, and then I also know what it's like to live in the flow of God. I know what it's like when your ministry is experiencing a flow. I know what it's like when your entrepreneurial pursuits are experiencing a flow. And I'm not saying that just because you're in the flow, you won't face opposition. But I am attempting to articulate to you that rocks don't stop rivers. There might be a rock of criticism, but it's not going to stop the flow. There might be a rock of hatred, but it's not going to stop the flow. There might be logs of setbacks, but it's not going to stop the flow. Somebody say the flow. And once you experience the rain of heaven, you will no longer settle for sprinklers. Talk Holy Spirit. Break down, down Pastor. What does that mean? Okay. The rain is God's participation in your situation. Sprinklers, that's your efforts. And a lot of people, you don't even recognize that you're outside of the will of God because you have so many sprinklers. But here's the difference. Sprinklers you have to pay for, but rain is free. This is so good. When God is endorsing a thing. Can we talk? Can we talk? Some of us are mad at what God said no to, but you're blaming people. See, because when you can identify the no of God, it helps you heal from rejection faster. It's not, they didn't want me. It's God saying, I've got something else planned. It's not that, man, why didn't they hire me? It's God saying, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And what you have planned is not my plan. Let's speak around this thought 
from this subject just for a few moments. I've got something else planned. I know you have plans, but I've got something else planned. I know you want to be married by 30, but I've got something else planned. I know you want your ministry to look like this, but I've got something else. Y'all talk to me. Planned. <laughs> and if this be true, we must be believers who can handle disappointment. This, this passage of scripture I want us to look at, Luke chapter 22. We're going to launch our reading at verse 31. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. <laughs> Check this passage out. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. Notice he calls him Simon right there and not Peter. Because sometimes we have Simon moments and other times we have Peter moments. There's a Simon and a Peter on the inside of all of us. There's a Jacob and an Israel on the inside of all of us. And if we were to be honest, we could say this. It all depends on which day you come at me, bro. It all depends on which day. <laughs> you come at me without my coffee, you're going to get Simon. You come at me 11.15 in church, you're going to get Peter. It all depends on the day. 49ers win, you're going to get Peter. They lose, you're going to get Simon. <laughs> Simon, Satan has asked for you to sift you as wheat. Sift means to shake, to toss back and forth, to rattle. So, Simon, Satan has asked to shake you up. But I've prayed for you that your faith would fail not. And once you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. See, the puzzling part about this biblical text, I'm not bothered over the part where Jesus says, strengthen your brother. I get that. That's Bible all day. Iron sharpens iron. Forsake not the assembly of the saints. I pour into you. You pour into me. I'm pushing you into spiritual maturity. You're pushing me into spiritual maturity. I get it. I need biblical friends in my life. Can I get somebody to say a real one? I'm talking about a real one to such a degree. When you win, they celebrate like they won. You have friends like that, like when you excited, they're like, what are we excited about? When you win, I'm not jealous over your win, but I can celebrate your win because sometimes God drops next level in front of you, not so that you can take offense, but so that you can take notes. I need to fast like that too. I need to pray like that too. I'm not trying to be like you, but maybe I need to have faith like you. I need friends in my life that will celebrate when I elevate and not feel intimidated because whatever room that God has for me is for me. I can't take your room. I don't want it. See, sometimes when you're connected to people like that, it won't even be your season, but it'll feel like your season. Because you're friends with somebody who's in season. Do you have Bible to corroborate your claim? I do. I'm glad you asked. Luke chapter 5, verse 5. If you look at this text, it says, Simon answered, Master, we've had all night, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a great, great large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners. So they signaled their partners. The repetition is on purpose. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. Okay. Jesus is in Peter's boat. He's not in his partner's boat. But since they're connected to somebody who has Jesus in their boat, we all eating fried catfish tonight. We all having stuffed flounder tonight. 
We're all benefiting from the catch. Not because he was in our boat, but I'm connected to people who have Jesus in their boat. I'm talking about anointed friends because the anointing breaks yokes. What if you had a whole circle where all your homies are breaking stuff off of each other? All of your homegirls are breaking stuff off of each other. All of us could worship. All of us could pray. All of us could fast. All of us could seek the Lord. Because if I don't know the Lord's voice in devotion, I won't know his voice in direction. Somebody say a real one. These are the type of friends that have your back behind your back. <laughs> because loyalty should not require my presence. Y'all better come get me. If I have to be there for you to be loyal, that's not loyalty. That's Judah's tendencies. See, because Judas knows how to conform to the circle of the Pharisees, but then he knows how to also conform to the circle of the disciples. Judas knows how to conform to the people who hate Jesus and want to get him killed, and he also knows how to conform to the circle who loves Jesus and worships, worships him. A real one. I'm not tripping over the part where he says, strengthen your brother. I'm not even bothered over the part when Jesus says, Simon... Satan has asked for you. That doesn't bother me because one of the, like the litmus tests that your birth was a problem. The irrefutable evidence and the indicator that you wake up, waking up each and every morning causes for fear to strike the camp of hell is revealed by continual enemy contact. If you want to know if your kingdom if you want to know if you're in purpose, if you want to know if you're making a difference, it will be revealed by the constant, persistent, relentless attacks of the enemy. Because hell has this motto, if you're going to live a life that gets on my nerves, we're going to try to get on yours. <laughs> I'm not tripping when he says, strengthen your brother. I'm not tripping when he says Satan has asked for you. The problem with this text that bothers me is Jesus' response. I've prayed for you. Okay, put yourself in the Bible. Okay, all right. Simon, Satan has asked for you to sift you as wheat. I'd have been like, what you going to do about him? Stop him. Somebody, he's asked for me. Stop him. Block him. Reroute him. Crush his head. Rebuke him. The devil is a liar. Jesus says, no. He's asked for you to sift you, to shake you up, and I'm praying. <laughs> Watch it, family. I'm praying that your faith would not fail. He's going to shake you up, and I'm going to allow it, but I'm praying for your faith. Sometimes, hell is behind problems because the agenda of a satanic problem is designed to get you to abandon your post. Please hear me. It's designed to get you to quit. It's designed to get you to fold. It's designed to get you to throw in the towel. Why do you think the text tells us, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap a harvest if you faint not. Hell focuses on the faint. I want you to faint. Problems. I use problems to try to get you to abandon your post. I'm talking to somebody. You have been thinking about abandoning your marriage. You have been thinking about abandoning your ministry. You have been thinking about abandoning the idea that God gave you. Why? Because God didn't answer your prayer the way that you wanted him to. And so due to disappointment, I'm done with all this Jesus stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm done. If God was really good, why didn't he stop it? Why didn't he stop it? See, there's tons, there's an embarrassing amount of information that could help you through the steps of grieving, the loss of a loved one. How do you grieve? There's stages. 
But one of the things I'm recognizing is we don't know how to grieve over what we thought was God's plan. See how quiet it's getting? Sometimes, you know what stress is? Not all the time. Sometimes stress and depression, I understand the different types of depression, situational depression, clinical depression. But I'm learning this as a pastor rather quickly. Sometimes what depression is, is the heart's way of grieving over what was not God's plan. Talk Holy Spirit, now it's time to teach. I'm, I'm, I'm so depressed, everybody's story different. But sometimes we're battling, grieving over what was not God's plan. How do you eulogize disappointment and still have this fruit of the Spirit? Joy. How do you eulogize disappointment and still have hope? How do you eulogize disappointment and still have a prayer life? The reason our prayer closets have cobwebs the reason the only time we open our Bible is when a pastor or somebody sends you a text and tells you to turn to scripture so-and-so. Understand that we're all in different places of our Christian journey, but sometimes it's due to you being disappointed with God. Simon, Satan has asked to shake you up, and I'm going to pray that your faith would not fail. I'm going to pray that you will not lose heart. It's purposeful pain. See, this is the danger with all of this teaching, this sugar-coated preaching to such a degree where Christians have cavities. Spiritual cavities. You're not called to be the sugar of the earth. You're called to be the salt of the earth. See? This is why all of this preaching, you're going to get a house and you're going to get a car. It's so dangerous because what do you do when God starts handing out crosses? You only know the Santa Claus Jesus, the house, the car, the raise, the promotion, the first millionaire in my family. But what do you do when God says, this season I'm crucifying your flesh. This season I'm killing your petty. This season I'm killing your pride. This season I'm teaching you how to honor your wife and wash away the spots that you keep complaining about. You're complaining to me about what you're assigned to heal. I gave you her so that she could experience the love of Christ. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Stop complaining to me about that spot wash it stop complaining to me about that wrinkle iron it I'm teaching you discipline so when he hands out crosses this is Bible all day Luke chapter 9 verse 23 then he said to them all whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me what do you do when he starts handing out crosses and are you spiritually mature enough to recognize this is not punishment, it's development? A cross, purposeful pain, purposeful pain. If I was a note taker, I'd write these few points down. Purposeful pain. It's not for a joy abduction, but rather a divine introduction. Purposeful pain, purposeful pain. Purposeful pain is preparation for what's coming not punishment for what was done purposeful pain purposeful pain teaches you what pleasure never could purposeful pain purposeful pain is when god puts your faith in the gym i need your faith to get some muscle I need your devotion to get some muscle. I want you to have a swole spirit man so that you're strong enough to withstand when I'm telling you I've got something else planned. This is interwoven all throughout the scriptures. Joseph experienced purposeful pain by being betrayed by his brothers. But that pain was a midwife that gave birth to his destiny because purpose and pain are married. More Bible. Ruth experienced purposeful pain with the death of her first husband, Malon. See, most of us only know about Boaz. All we know is Ruth and Boaz. We don't know about her first husband, Malon. Why? Because what God is going to do in, in your next is so big, you're going to forget about your last. We're not preaching about Malon. 
all the sermons about Ruth and Boaz, but Malon had to die before she could ever experience. It hurt, but it was the midwife to her destiny. Purposeful pain, purposeful pain. Esther experienced purposeful pain with Haman saying he's going to slaughter all of the Jews, which is her family. But it was a midwife to give birth to her destiny. Even Jesus experienced purposeful pain by being nailed on the cross so that you and I could experience salvation. I just gave you biblical icon after biblical icon. If they are going to experience purposeful pain, what makes you think that you won't? preaching like this because a lot of us can't handle storms can I tell you how amazing God is as I begin to study this I'm like okay sifting is what harvesters did to wheat they would shake it rattle it and toss it back and forth to get the chaff off the wheat this is so good so God is so boss where he says, I'm going to let the devil do my work. I want that petty to come off you anyway, Peter. So I'm going to let him sh shake you up. I want that attitude, y'all don't want to talk to me, to come off anyway. So I'm going to let it shake you up. I need you to be nicer. If Jesus is good, can you please act like you're saved? Act like your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life? Why are you always walking around like something stinks? It doesn't stink. You're saved. You have the grace. You have salvation. I need a teaching you love. I need a teaching you grace. And I can only get that in you by you being shaken up. Because I need that to fall off anyway. Can I keep going? Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Soon after, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the casket that they were carrying him in or on, depending on your translations, and the barrier stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. I could never be a pallbearer ever again. <laughs> After that moment, I'm carrying the casket, and old buddy just comes back, pops up, and the Bible says he started talking. So I don't know if he was like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm good. This, this widow, please don't miss this. This widow already lost her husband. She's probably still struggling to catch the breath of recovering from one loss. And now she has to experience another loss. Have you ever felt like it's hit after hit after hit after hit? But she had no idea that God was trusting her with disappointment. Y'all missed it. God was trusting her with disappointment. She had no idea that her pain place was about to transition into her praise place. She had no idea, but before she got there, she had to first experience disappointment. I was thinking about this woman. I said, my goodness. Could, could you imagine? Let, let's just say she was madly in love with her husband. He died, and then now her son dies. That's the only part of my husband that I have left. You don't think she experienced being arrested with disappointment? But disappointment leads you to appointments. Rewind, say it one more time. <laughs> disappointment leads you to appointments. 
I'm trying to give you a perspective shift. She had no idea that we're not going to end the day eulogizing my son. We're going to end the day having a miracle about my son. But before the miracle, there was disappointment. I want y'all to remember this. Disappointment is not for devastation, but rather for direction. This is like aha moment for somebody. Disappointment is not for devastation. It's for direction. It shows you the way that God wants you to go versus the way that you thought you should go. I'm talking about disappointment. When you're trying to measure yourself, but you find yourself always coming up short. Disappointment, disappointment. The disappointment when you're pouring into others, but they're not pouring back into you, which leads to helper's fatigue. Helper's fatigue, that's the exhaustion you feel when you're treating them like a priority, but they're treating you like an option. And then you say that you're burned out, but understand, burned out doesn't always mean that you're doing too much. Sometimes it means that you're trying to give from a place of nothing. Disappointment. Disappointment. And in her disappointment, the Lord shows her this was an appointment. What if the whole time, whatever you're disappointed about, God is saying this is actually an appointment. Can I prove something else to you? Y'all don't want him to come to the left side. Can I prove something else to you? All right. I want you to see this Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. Is this good? Ruth chapter 2. I saw something that really, really blessed my life. Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. It says, so Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. This woman just preached and didn't even know it. She said, okay, Naomi, I'm going to go to the field and whatever field doesn't receive me, I'm not going to be disappointed. That's going to direct me to another field. I'm trying to find whom sight I may find favor in. So if I step in this field and I don't have favor, I'm not tripping because that means that's not my field. If I step in this field and I don't find favor, I'm not tripping because that means this is not my field. I'm trying to find whom sight I may find favor in because when I find the favor, then I find the place. And a lot of us don't even recognize that your disappointment is actually pointing you to your appointment. Yeah, but God's just taking too long. <laughs> Some of us try to encourage ourselves and say churchy things like, delay doesn't mean denial. Can I mess y'all up? Nobody said nothing. I'm asked again. Can I mess y'all up? There's no such thing as delay for the believer. It's you gave it a deadline and you're calling it delayed. You gave God a time frame and you're calling it delay. Let me give you Bible so that y'all can see I'm not up here preaching my opinion. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed, what's that word? Time. An appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. In other words, it's tarrying to you, but it's not tarrying to me. You wait on it because it has an appointed time. It's not delayed, it's just not the appointed time. That's how we get appointments, because there is a such thing as an appointed time. If you have a flight tomorrow at 1 p.m. and you go to the airport today and say, I wanna board my flight, they're not gonna tell you your flight got delayed. They're gonna tell you it's not the appointed time. And if you try to rush the time, you could lose your seat. God's just delayed. No, it's not the appointed time. I want to give you these points, especially for those who have been battling disappointment. I want to help somebody understand something about how your brain works. The reason the disappointment feels so fresh 
is because when you meditate on what disappointed you, you are literally causing for the body to release the same exact chemicals it did when you first were disappointed. So if something disappointed you in 2017 and you meditate on it, this is why it still feels so alive in you in 2023. Because when it happened, your brain released something called cortisol. That's your stress response. And when you meditate on the disappointment, you are causing for your brain to release cortisol so that you're feeling the same amount of stress that you did in 2017 that you're feeling right now in 2023. Cortisol, your stress response is your inward alarm. So when you keep on meditating on disappointment, your mind is literally saying, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? And when you meditate on that versus what the Bible says, meditate on thy law day and night. Think on these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is just, whatever is noble, whatever is of good report. Think on these things. Meditate. Because God knows that's going to regulate the chemicals that your brain has been designed to release. Meditate on my word. Could you be disappointed because you keep rehearsing it? Disappointment is married to discouragement. And when disappointment and discouragement get intimate, they have a child called depression. Speak Holy Spirit. I want to give you these four points, and I'm done. Number one, stop performing CPR on Malon. That's Ruth's first husband. That's the dead thing. You're disappointed because you're trying to resuscitate what God is saying, let it die. Because I've got something else planned. Don't sabotage your future peace because chaos is familiar. It's not for devastation, it's for direction. Point number two disappointment is a compass, not a verdict. It's a compass, means it points you, it's not a verdict. It's okay for you to experience something that was disappointing, but I refuse to live in a state of being disappointed. Does that make sense? Okay. I, I really want us to grasp this. I'm allowing this to happen because I need your faith stronger. Without this happening, your faith would not be stronger. Number three. The appointed time can't be rushed. It can't be rushed. God does not operate by your deadlines. Stop thinking, if I do this, if I could do that, if I do, you're just lining yourself up to experience your appointment. But the appointed time can't be rushed. And last point, number four, everybody needs to participate with me with this. God could change it just like, I need everybody, put your left hand in the air. Left hand, left hand. We're going to act like we're the poetry night. I want y'all to help me. Let's see if we can do it. One band, one sound. Okay. God could change it just like, I like that. One more time because th this is what this woman shows us in the text. It was her pain place, but God changed it. To her praise place just like so now can God trust you with disappointment during this funeral service mourning hurting because her son has died Jesus walks up to her and says don't cry I'm like not I extend to you my condolences Sorry for your loss. Don't cry. I've got something else planned. He walks up and he touches the casket. And the Bible says everybody stood still. You know what the king of glory just did? He stepped in and said, pause. 
this is not going to end to death. Pause. And I've arrived to this place, family. I thank God for every single time I was about to do something. And he stepped in and said, pause. Bullets whistling past my ears. It could have been my life. Jesus stepped in and said, pause. About to divorce a spouse. Jesus steps in and says, pause. Pause. And I'm so thankful for all the times when I try to pl press play. He says, no, pause. Can I trust you with disappointment? Because it's not punishment. It's redirection. And I felt led, hear me. I felt led coming all the way from Houston. I've always wanted to say this. I haven't had a chance to say this. All the way to the west side. <laughs> because somebody's about to give up. Somebody measures God's goodness by what he gives. And I want to encourage you for the days that are about to come up on our nation. You can't have lukewarm faith. You can't. I've got something else planned. I'm not stopping the sifting. I'm going to let him die. Because I've got something else planned. And we must be believers who stop judging God by what he gives us versus thanking God for what he doesn't. I know that this is unorthodox. I'm going to pray and we're done. But how about this? Can we all give God a praise right now for what he didn't do? He didn't open the door. He didn't allow you to get that job. He didn't stop the breakup. He didn't allow you to get promoted. He didn't. Why? Because I've got something else planned. So, Father, at this moment, help us to remember that we are the clay and you're the potter. Forgive us, God, of having control issues, trying to control what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow belongs to you. Maybe we're so stressed out because we're trying to handle God weight. Tomorrow is God weight. Help us to get back in our place and trust your pace and also trust your no. You're good even when life isn't. And forgive us, Father, for treating you like Santa Claus, just giving you our wish list. Help us to give you our life. And we surrender our will to you. Strengthen the depths of our obedience so that we will no longer quit when it gets hard. We won't throw in the towel. We'll use the towel to wipe our sweat but keep going. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says amen. God bless amen. you. Amen. Powell, thank you, Pastor Jerry. Right where you're at, right where you're at, I want you to stay right here. In fact, everybody sit down for a second. Pastor Jerry just brought a word that I know I needed to hear. I needed to hear this word. This was a word from the Lord for me. Was that a word for you? Now, this is the most important part of our service. This is the moment where we say, Holy Spirit, take it to the next level. I learned something, I got a great word, I heard what you needed to say to me today, but God, I need to go to the next step. I know there's some people in this room right now that you've been disappointed. Maybe you've been discouraged, maybe you've even de depressed. In the middle of the storm, in the middle of those circumstances, you started to lose hope. You started to doubt, you started to wonder if your faith was even real. And right now, this message is God speaking to you saying, I'm right here. 
I'm in the no. I'm in the disappointment. I'm in the failure. I'm in the closed door. And so I want to make a call to two, tif- do two different types of people. The first is that group that's saying, hey, I'm a believer, but I, I've lost faith. I'm a believer, but I've been discouraged. I'm a believer, but I need some, something else from God. I need a moment where I recognize I'm turning away from the choice to be disappointed. I'm turning away from this failure in my life to recognize that that no was actually God directing my steps. And I'm going to choose today to walk in faith and even a little joy over what he's doing. So if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand right where you're at, saying, I'm that person. I've been disappointed. I've been discouraged. I've been, I've been that, that closed door threw me for a loop, that, that no at the job site, said, I, I didn't see it coming, but I'm here and I'm saying I want God to help me walk through that. The second call here is for somebody who hasn't had the faith at all. You know, life's full of disappointments, and some of them we brought on ourselves. We made the wrong choice. We made the wrong decision. We walked into that bar again. We walked into that house again that we knew we shouldn't have, and the consequences are very clear in our life right now. There's a mistake, a failure. You're, you're paying the consequence of a, of a crime you committed. Maybe it's a relational. Maybe you said the wrong thing, and you knew, I shouldn't say this, but hmm couldn't stop yourself. And now you're here today and you're saying, man, all I see around me is broken pieces. All I see around me are disappointments. I don't just see closed doors. I see every door closed. But I'm here to tell you there is a door that's open to you. There's only one door that can change everything, and that's the door of Jesus Christ. He paid the price for every one of those failures. He paid the price for every disappointment. He paid the price for every mistake. And today as a church, we're all sitting here waiting for you to say, yes, I want to walk through that door. I want to have Jesus make things right. I want him to guide me to the next place. And so if you're that person, you're saying, I, I know that I, I, need, I need God. I need Jesus. I need, a, I need something that I don't have in myself. And that can only be found in Jesus. I want you to raise your hand and say, I'm ready. I I want God in my life. I want Jesus. I want help. I want hope. I want a way out. I want what God has for me. Let me see those hands. Let me see those hands. I see your hands. I see your hand. I see your hand. Proud of you. I see your hand. Proud of you. I see your hand. I'm proud of you. It takes a real man, a real woman, to say, I need Jesus, I need help, I can't do this on my own. Every person in this room has come to the place that you're at right now and they've recognized there's only one way forward and that's for me to surrender to my life to God, to give Jesus my heart, my all, so that he can make it what it's supposed to be. So right now we're going to invite our altar team to come forward and I want all of us to stand together. This is a moment of prayer for us as a church. This is not a moment for us to leave. This is a moment where we are praying for souls to be saved. We are praying for people's lives to be changed forever. And so just for a few minutes, church, I want to encourage you. I know some of us might have a responsibility, but if you can stay with us for just a few more minutes and treat this like the moment it is, a moment where someone's eternity is going to be changed forever. Treat this like it's your daughter, your son, your mom, your dad, your brother walking to the front right now and pray with all of your heart that this be the moment that their lives are changed forever. But there's two calls for us to come to today. One is I'm dealing with that disappointment and I haven't, I haven't always seen my way out of this. I haven't had the faith that I wanted. I haven't recognized that God was in this. And today I'm saying I'm done with that disappointment. I'm done with that discouragement. I'm done with that depression. I am choosing today to see the hand of God in these circumstances and I'm going to believe. If you're one of those people, I want you to come forward right now. You're saying, I got to make a declaration today. I'm done with that old way of thinking. I'm done with that old way of seeing. I am going to walk in faith. I'm going to believe. I'm going to see God's goodness in every no, in every decision that my life has. And then there's the second group. Those of you who raised your hand and you said, I know 
that some of the disappointment, the failure I'm in is my own fault. It's my choice. I put myself there, and right now I'm saying I'm done. I'm done with the old way of life. I'm done with the old way of living. I'm done with doing things my way. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to come forward. I see you coming. Would you give them a round of applause as they come? Would you thank God for what he's doing and lives being changed? I'm proud of you. It takes a real man or woman to do this. This is not something easy to say, I'm coming and I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm surrendering my way of living and my way of thinking for him. So grateful for every one of you who come forward. We're going to pray together as a church right now. And if you're already out there, you should be interceding. You should be praying. You should be praying for these people here at the front. You can stretch your hands if you need to, but pray for them. And guys, every one of you at the front, if you could just for one minute, Wherever you're at, whether you're here to just surrender to disappointment and walk in faith or you're saying, I need to surrender my whole life, not just, not just disappointment, but everything about me. We have people here at the front that want to help you. They want to take you on the next step of your journey. They're going to help you sign up for I, at uh, igotsaved.com, and that is just simply a way for you to go to the next step. We're going to get plugged into starting at the way. We're going to help you on this journey. We're going to help you to walk this thing out in faith. We're going to help you to, to walk through some seasons that maybe you don't understand. And it's all going to be based on this, on the power of God at work in your life. It's the power of the gospel. And so right now we're going to pray together. And we're going to pray that God change everything in this moment for you, okay? So repeat this after me. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Every disappointment, every discouragement, every failure, I give it to you. I put it all in your hands because I know you're a good God and you know what to do with it. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my job. I trust you with my all. I surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give a round of applause for every one of these who's prayed that prayer? The simple prayer, but it's powerful. I'm proud of you. Proud of you being up here. So right now, guys, every one of you guys, you have an altar work in front of you. Continue to pray with them. Make sure you don't leave here without talking that through. But for the rest of us, God bless you so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. We pray that you will be with us at Pomona's grand opening this Thursday, Friday, and next Sunday. Uh, is the grand opening for Pomona. Wednesday night, we're going to continue our series on the Holy Ghost, so don't miss that opportunity. We love you. God bless you.